hate you and you have been nothing of a father. How could you do this to him? I absolutely had nothing to do with Dylan's disappearance. The father-son relationship can be a complex and difficult one to navigate. Young children tend to look up to their parents, and they are usually the child's first role models. This helps children feel closer to their parents and feel as though they are dependable. The connection and relatability is strengthened between same-sex parents and child. Fathers also may parent genders differently, which can be a subconscious act, for example, protecting the daughter and guiding or teaching the son. If a father has strong beliefs about their role as a parent and that gets shattered by their own hypocritical actions, they may feel like they have failed as a parent. An example could be telling their child not to drink, but the child sees their father drink, so they lose that respect for their authority. A father's feelings of failure and lack of respect from their child can lead to a spiral out of control. In today's video, we will look at Mark Redwine, a father with a secret life that led to his son's murder. Mark lived in a mountain town called Bayfield, Colorado. He has three sons with different women. His two oldest are Brandon and Corey, and his youngest was Dylan, a 13-year-old boy who he killed. Due to thick snow coverage dragging out the evidence collection over a few years and court delays, it took nine years for Mark Redwine to be sentenced for the death of his son. Dylan lived with his mother about five hours away from Mark. Mark and Dylan's mother were in the process of divorce, and Mark was given court-mandated visits with Dylan. It was June 2011 when Mark took two of his sons, Corey and Dylan, on a road trip. During this road trip, Dylan was using his father's laptop while Mark was sleeping. Dylan noticed pictures of his father that made him uncomfortable. He took Corey into the bathroom to show him the photos. Corey took pictures of these photos with his phone. They collected their thoughts and went on with the trip as if nothing had happened. We will hear Corey recount in his court testimony the experience he had finding out intimate details of his father's personal tendencies. Dylan, uh, back in 2011, was he 12 years old? I believe so, yeah. Um, how did he react to seeing those photographs of his father? Um, he was pretty disgusted. Um, it was something that he... Um, he kind of had to try to contain himself. Um, when we found the pictures, we were in the um, hotel room with Mark at the time, um, and Mark was sleeping, um, and Dylan was on his laptop, and I walked into the room. Um, I had a conversation with my current wife, um, just checking up on her since I was on the road, and when I walked into the room, um, Dylan just kind of grabbed my attention, um, was trying to be quiet, but obviously um, was energetic, um, kind of, you know, like, come here, I got to show you this, I got to show you this, kept pulling me, and then um, took me into the bathroom where we closed the door and locked it, and um, that's when he showed me the pictures that he had found. Warning, skip 20 seconds ahead to bypass the descriptive details and pictures. Um, he found pictures of Mark dressed in women's clothing, um, wearing a diaper, um, taking selfies of him, wearing the clothing, um, wearing the diaper, um, eating the feces that was in the diaper, um, and uh, just that's pretty much it. Still in uh, back in 2011, was he 12 years old? I believe so, yeah. Um, how did he react to seeing those photographs of his father? Um, he was pretty disgusted. Did it impact the, uh, his view of the defendant moving forward? Yes. How so? Um, it, he still lost a, uh, um, any reasons for him to look up to, to Mark that day. Did you notice that in observing their relationship together from that point moving forward? Yes. The compulsive act of consuming fecal matter is known as coprophagia and is rare. There have been known associations with this compulsion in multiple disorders, like schizophrenia, dementia, and obsessive compulsive disorder. However, in this case, it is likely a fetish. Corey did not do anything with the photos on his phone and did not tell anyone about them. 
Over a year went by before the photos were brought up to Mark. With the divorce going on and ever since Dylan found out information about his father that made him feel uncomfortable, his relationship with Mark was deteriorating. Dylan didn't want anything to do with his father, but Mark would text Dylan and most messages went without a reply. Despite this, in August 2012, Mark was on another road trip, but only with Dylan this time. Mark expressed to Dylan that he believed his mother and brother were bad influences on him. These are two people that Dylan were close with and felt offensive when Mark attacked their character. Corey recounted the messages he received from Dylan and the way he wanted to blackmail their father with the pictures. I already talked about how there weren't a whole lot of visits um, between Dylan and, and the defendant, but was there a Boston trip in August of 2012? Yes. And who was going on that trip? That was Dylan and Mark. And at this point in time, uh, were you getting along with the defendant any longer? No. And you, at this point in time, I just want to put it down as sort of a landmark in the timeline, but um, had everyone already moved out of the windmill home at this time? Yes. And were there discussions about custody, things like that, ongoing at this time? Yes. But at this time, was it still a joint custody technically, even if not in practice? Yes. So what did you know about the trip that Dylan was going to do in August of 2012? Um, I know that the previous trip, um, you know, we had um, had some fun, and um, Mark wanted to do that again with Dylan. Um, I, from where I was um, in my communications with Dylan, it didn't sound like it went the same. Um, there was um, a lot of times that Dylan had reached out to me, um, you know, just... Um, for, for various reasons, um, but none of which were, you know, for um, just to say hi to, you know, he was he was pretty upset about something every time he reached out to me. Uh, upset with whom? With Mark. And you, are you talking about on the trip or leading up to the trip? Um, on the trip. Okay. Yeah, I know he, um, or Mark, um, was, you know, or had voiced his opinion to Dylan um, on what we were, um, and clearly Dylan never shared the same opinion. Um, so he got frustrated when, um, you know, two people that Dylan loved and cared about were um, not being represented correctly in Dylan's eyes. Now, did you receive a phone call uh, at one point while Dylan was on the baseball trip when he was particularly upset? Yeah. Can you explain that to the jury? Yeah. Um, he called me on the trip um, and I wasn't able, I was in a movie at the time, so I wasn't able to respond directly. Um, so he called me a few times um, and then by the, I want to say the third or fourth call, I knew that something was going on. Um, so I had left the, the movie and then walked out, checked my phone um, and seen that Dylan had called um, and texted me about asking for the pictures previously shown. When you walked out of the movie, were there already texts waiting on your phone? Yeah, there was, um, I want to say, probably three to four texts at that time with five or six missed calls. And what was Dylan asking, if anything? He was asking for me to send him those pictures. We will hear Corey read messages he sent to Dylan the night that Dylan was on the road trip with Mark. Corey will state that he did not send the pictures that Dylan requested to blackmail Mark because he knew Dylan and Mark were arguing and nothing good would come from it. However, Corey did send the pictures directly to Mark while they were on the road trip. Four hours later, what does Dylan text to you? He said, hey, send me those poop pics of Papa because he gave me a speech about you guys being a bad example and I want to show him what he really is. Now, did you, did you learn from your phone calls with Dylan and conversations with Dylan what was going on around this point in time between Dylan and the defendant? Briefly, um, I don't recall, um, you know, any specifics between Dylan or Mark, um, but I do remember just the discussion I had with Dylan. Was there an argument? Yes. And was he upset with uh, the defendant? Yeah, he sent me um, the request to go. Um, or send him the pictures to show um, Mark what he really is. As you scroll down, did you in fact send the pictures to your brother? No, I did not. Why not? 
Um, I just wanted to see how the day was going to go and um, follow up with them the previous day and um, just see if their relationship was okay or what steps I needed to take. So the next day you, you followed up with them? Yes. Did you have concerns about if they were in an argument sending those photographs uh, to Dylan in that context? Yes. Why? Um, I was just worried about where Dylan was and I didn't want any more confrontation um, with Dylan being as upset as he was in sending those messages. Um, I didn't really want to send something more to fuel a bigger fire. When Mark was confronted with the information that his child knew about him, he most likely felt embarrassed and disrespected. His embarrassment could have led to rage. However, I would argue it goes deeper than embarrassment. Mark went from having sons that respected him and looked up to him to some extent to sons that were disgusted by him. The quick shift in lack of respect and verbal hatred likely led to Mark spiraling out of control. Mr. Redwine, while your father and Dylan were on that trip between Bicito and Boston alone together, you sent those photographs, didn't you? Yes. On August 5th, 2012, when you sent those photographs, you also wrote some things, right? Yes. Said to your father, hey, beautiful. Right? Yes. You said, you are what you eat, look in the mirror, right? Yes. Called your dad out for judging you, correct? Yes. That was in part your reaction to Dylan saying you'd been called a bad example, right? Yes. And you said, oh, and sweetie, this is Corey, right? Yes. Told him to, quote, each. Yes. Told him he was a coward, correct? Yes. Called him a sh eater, right? Yes. You said, pull yourself Pull yourself to each, right? Yes. You called him nasty. Yes. Said the pics were the nastiest thing you'd ever seen. Yes. Called him a eating coward, right? Yes. Told him he was a sperm donor. Yes. Said you'd talk more than you eat, right? Yes. Told him to lick off your shoe. Yes. When you said that, he was all alone with Dylan on the drive from Viacito headed towards Boston, correct? Yes. It was November 18th, 2012, when Dylan had a court-ordered visit with his father. He did not want to go because Mark's house was in the middle of nowhere, and he did not have a good relationship with his father at this point. Despite this, Dylan went to stay a few nights with Mark, since the judge told his mother that he must go. Dylan's plan was to make arrangements to hang out with his friends during his stay to avoid having to be with his father. When Dylan arrived, they went to Walmart and McDonald's. The whole time, Dylan was standoffish. Even outsiders looking in could tell there was tension between him and Mark. What exactly happened the remainder of that night and the next morning is unknown. The only person that can testify to what happened is Mark, which, as we will see, is unreliable. It's worth noting that Dylan was glued to his phone and was always texting friends and his mom with quick response times. The last text he ever sent was at 9.37 p.m. Mark's story is that the next morning he woke up and went into town to get groceries. This was a process since he lived in such an isolated area. According to Mark, Dylan was sleeping at the house and he was trying to get a hold of him to ask him about what he would like to do for Thanksgiving. After numerous tries, Dylan did not answer the phone. We will hear Mark in a news interview recount his story of what happened that day. Texting about that time, and he was texting on the couch after we were here watching the movie. He was over there texting or playing a video game or something. I just assumed he was texting because it's not like that he can't ever get service up here. It's just very sporadic. So, so you guys watched the movie, and then, and then you had plans to go, and then, and then what happened? Did he just? Well, we were watching the movie together. Remember the movie being finished. I, at some point, was pacing the floor and got up and was taking care of a few little things, you know, over here at the kitchen table while we were doing that. But, you know, it was shortly after the ending of that movie, which my guess, and I don't recall because I don't keep track of the clock, you know, it, it must have been, I thought it was earlier in the beginning. Because I was fairly tired anyway, and I, I know Dylan was tired because he indicated to me that because he'd been up till 4 o'clock the night before and that he had spent most of the day in the airport traveling to get here, that he was tired. And 
you know, it seems to me it had been about 10, 30-ish maybe by the time the movie got done, somewhere in there. And, you know, I, I get up to go run my errands because I had a payroll issue that needed to be dealt with first thing Monday morning because that's when payroll goes in. Mm -hmm. And so it was important for me to get down there as early as possible. Well, I, I wanted to leave at 6.30, so I'd be there at 7.30 when they opened the doors. You know, I spent 45 minutes, an hour, trying to get Dylan to wake up and, you know, helping him, saying, you know, Dylan, I'm going down. Because he would talk to me about going to see his friend, Ryan, mm -hmm. that morning. But he wasn't having no part of it, which is not uncommon for him. I mean, you can't get him to bed and you can't get him up. Did you, did you rush back at all? Did you think, like, well, that's weird, I haven't heard from Dylan or anything? No, I was going to stop at the store and pick up some stuff. I was trying to get hold of him to get a better idea of what we were going to be trying to do for Thanksgiving, knowing that I was in Durango and that I could pick up things if we needed them for Thanksgiving or what we were going to kind of do. So that was my biggest reason for trying to communicate with him. You know, he's had time to sleep on it for a night, so at this point, you know, maybe he's thought about it and can give me some way to figure out where we're going from here. You know, when you drive up here, you don't want to go to Durango again the next day. So you have to think ahead, you know. You got to make sure you pick up everything you need while you're in town because it's a long way to Durango or Bayfield to get something you've overlooked. Mark knew people were looking at him for answers for what happened to Dylan since he was the last one to see him. Mark agreed to do interviews like this one in an attempt to not look suspicious. The interviews Mark took part in were a couple of months before Dylan's remains were found. This was the perfect opportunity for Mark to tell his story and emphasize his attempts he made to locate his son. Mark first admits he took a nap since he wasn't worried his son was not home or could not be reached by phone, which according to the rest of Dylan's family would be unusual for him. Then Mark will recount all the lengths he went to to find Dylan, like going to his friends' homes. Well, when I got home and he wasn't here, I didn't think much of it at the time. Because it's not unlike him to go wandering off and he'll walk down to the river across the street or, you know, he might go up into the campground where he can be next to the river up there. I didn't think a whole lot of it. And I had laid down and took a nap which is something I try to do as much as I can when I'm not working because we always work, you know, 14-hour days. And it feels good to be home. And it was probably 2.30 by the time I realized that Dylan still's not home. And so I'm, I'm thinking, well, if he ain't going to return my text messages and I ain't hearing my phone ringing because he ain't calling me, I need to go find that boy. So I stopped by his friend Tristan's house down across from the marina up here at the lake and nobody answered the door. So I'm thinking, well, I didn't see his fishing pole, you know, and I thought maybe he'd have wandered off and got, went fishing, so maybe he was with Tristan at the lake. So I'm driving by the lake, looking for him and Tristan, didn't see anything. As I was going down to Bayfield to check with Ryan, who I found at his friend Fernando's house, and as soon as I went to Fernando, because I don't know where all of them live, but I knew where a couple of them live, enough to get pointed in the right direction. This, First place I went, boom, there's Ryan and Fernando. And first words out of their mouth, we haven't heard from Dylan all day. But that's when it hit me, that something wasn't right. And I immediately went to the marshal's office in Bayfield. But at that moment in time, I felt the need to address this issue with mom. So I immediately asked her, had she heard from him? And indicated to her that, you know, I hadn't heard from him all day. And then I was at the marshal's office taking care of this. And that's when, you know, pretty much all hell broke loose with her. He and I get along when we're together, contrary to what other people might think. And I, I can only contribute that to him being a peacekeeper because he doesn't want to see any turmoil between mom and dad. And I think very much he, he fights to prevent that as best that he knows how to do. I do blame myself. I, I, I relive this a thousand times, and every time it comes back to, I've seen him laying on the couch, and I didn't try hard enough maybe to wake him up, to have him come with me, knowing that he had talked about going to spend time with his friends and letting him sleep like he does so many times before. I beat myself up over that constantly. But that's not, that's not helping me, and it's not helping Dylan. I mean... 
it's hard enough f for any parent to have to deal with something like this. And, and, and to sit here and beat yourself up over and over and over again about what you could have done differently, could have made the difference, is not helping me stay strong, which is what I feel like I need to do for Dylan. I don't know how to do it, and I struggle with that every day. But it's, just, it's something that I believe that I have to dig down deeper and deeper every day to find those will and to find the strength to stay strong for him because I believe that he needs both of his parents. He needs me to do that for him, and I know he needs his mom to do that for him. We will look at some text between Mark and Dylan's mother, Elaine. Mark texted her before he filed a missing persons report. Before Elaine becomes accusatory, we will hear Mark try to reassure her. However, the subtext and tone comes off as very defensive. Their messages read, Elaine, I wonder if you heard from Dylan. I've been trying to reach him all afternoon. Elaine, it's really worrying me when I'm seven hours away and get a message like this from you. I haven't heard from Dylan today. Where did you leave him or last see him? I went to town for errands and he was fine. I'm just concerned and thought you may have heard from him. It's weird that he would just up and leave. Does he have his phone? I agree, which is why I am asking if you have heard from him. I assume he does and why I have sent him text and called. What I don't know is if he has a charger or if it's charged. I am terribly freaked out that he's roaming around in the dark. I think we should call the police. I didn't want to freak you out as I'm sure he's fine, but don't think I'm not concerned. I just left the Bayfield Marshal's office and headed back to the house. Did you get into a fight with him or something? How long has he been missing? No, we talked and everything is fine. Several hours? Well, it's not fine he's missing. Have you heard anything from Dylan? You said you called the Marshal's office. They have no record of you calling them. I called them. Have you heard from him? No, I am extremely concerned at this point. I just left Tristan's house and he has not seen him. Waiting for the sheriff to call back. I'm doing all I can and will let you know the moment I hear from him. He wouldn't just leave. He would have called me. I am so suspect of you right now. How could he just disappear? It's just like you to blame me. Right now, the best thing for him is finding him. Are you looking for him? What are you doing to find him? You seem so nonchalant that our kid is missing. You talked to him on a cell phone this morning or when you left the house. Did you talk to him at all today on his cell phone? I personally spoke with him this morning. The sheriff is here now. I'm doing all I can. Mark was also sure to text Dylan's phone to ask about his whereabouts to play the role of the concerned father. Interestingly, Mark texted Dylan two months after his disappearance, wishing him a happy new year, as if in denial he is gone. Mark mentioned that Dylan's fishing pole was gone, so a search began around the lake. This is interesting because Dylan's mother expressed that he did not like things like fishing. The mix-up could be Mark's perception of what he wanted his son to be, rather than what Dylan actually liked to do. February 2013, Dylan's mother claimed that Mark would not correspond with her, so they went on the Dr. Phil show so they could address their concerns and bring awareness to the case. I personally have a lot of suspicions that Elaine could be involved in this, but I don't have anything to back that up, and I don't have anything to support that. Do you honestly believe that from six hours away that she put him on an airplane and flew him to you and then somehow or another trailed behind and abducted him from your couch? Is that your theory? Well, I don't believe that she did it alone. I believe that it's possible that she had helped do that. Okay, so you actually think that she and a team trailed behind him, and do you think she would have taken him against his will? Or do you think he cooperated in this? Well, that, I, those, I are, those, those, those are questions that I can't answer because I don't know. I don't know what happened. Dylan didn't really look up to Mark. They had a relationship, but it was never what Dylan had wanted. It was always what Mark had wanted, which was always to be on the road. Really? Never there. Why do you call your father Mark instead of dad or because he's father. not a father to me a father is someone who cares for their kids and you know would do anything for him be a I role believe, model someone i to believe look up that to. you're being very disrespectful and i believe that everything that's coming out of your mouth is perpetuated by i your have mother. my own mouth i can say then my own it. words i am at you i don't like you i hate you and 
You have been nothing of a father. People in Mark's life claimed he made odd remarks in the past, one being his ex recalling a time in the 80s when they were in the mountains and Mark said this would be a good spot to dispose of a body. While this is odd, this doesn't prove anything since Dylan wasn't even thought of back then. In June 2013, some of Dylan's remains were found in the mountains. It took a while due to all the snow coverage during the winter months. Mark's oldest son, Brandon, recalls a conversation he had with his father when the discovery of the remains was announced. Brandon claims Mark mentioned blunt force trauma and at this point the skull was not found, which was the portion of the remains that revealed blunt force trauma. This rose concern in Brandon, since at this point no one should know anything about blunt force trauma being a cause of death. We will hear Brandon recount the conversation he had with his father and the uneasy feeling he had due to the way he said the words blunt force trauma. We stayed around in this region for about four days, right? Or four or five days, is that right? About that, correct. And during that, that whole stretch of time, what was um, Mark Redwine's attitude towards, the, towards participating in the searches for Dylan? I didn't really see Mark get involved, I know. I would talk to him about some things, but there was no action. Do you remember him saying that he knew where Dylan was? I do what remember. Did he, what did he that. say to you? I was talking to him, and if you know where he's at, why are we still looking? And he was just telling me, Dylan's in my heart. And I remember thinking, that's just a BS answer. Like, it doesn't make sense that as your son missing. Do you remember the exact phrase, how he said it? Yeah, he said, Dylan's in my heart. Did he say, I know where Dylan is? He's I know where heart. Dylan's at. He's in my heart. Okay. Okay. Do you remember any specific conversations or statements from Mark Redwine that stuck out to you that you wanted to share with us? Because we were talking about the remains. I asked Mark what was found, and he did tell me a fingertip, a collarbone, and a finger bone or fingertip, and then I was trying to get information about what he thought happened. I thought that was something, he knows this area better than me, so I wanted to know what Mark thought, and he would talk to me about different possible outcomes, like animal attacks or being shot by hunters, and then he'd always go back to blunt force trauma, and it was just such a distinctive, a different way of talking any other time. So that's what got my attention. Help me understand. I mean, it sounds like you're listening very closely to the way he's talking, described his demeanor, lack of emotion. Did it change? Did his, did his inflection or his voice or change when he used the term blunt force trauma? No, his emotion didn't change, but his voice, there was a lot more passion in the way he was saying it, and that just caught me off guard because I didn't understand. Had you ever brought up to him this idea of blunt force trauma, like prior in the conversation, anything never. like that? I never did. And had you ever heard anybody else talking to him about blunt force trauma when you were around him? Not to Mark. The only other time I've heard it is on TV in the shows. Okay. So he brought it up to you. And how you said his, his voice was more passionate? What do you mean? Can you help me understand that? Yeah, so uh, he's just talking and then when he went to blunt force trauma, like I just said blunt force trauma in the same way, but with him it was always it, blunt force trauma, it, very direct. And it, that always, it, like it got my attention on a very big level. I always, like I would have the conversations and I remember telling my wife, he's telling me what happened. And he's not telling me what exactly was used, but we don't have enough information to be thinking about blunt force trauma. It just shocked me a little bit because I didn't see where it was coming from. By August 2015, Mark was officially announced as a person of interest in the case. It wasn't until November 2015 when Dylan's skull was found just a mile and a half from the other remains. They discovered evidence of blunt force trauma and knife marks that would lead one to conclude that the head was removed from the body. It was thought to be unlikely that any animal that inhabited the area would drag it that far. Searches of Mark's home were performed and they found evidence of blood stains throughout the living room. They also brought in cadaver dogs and those dogs signaled in the living room and in the bed of his truck. 
In 2017, he was arrested in Washington State while he was on the road during a trucking job. A trucking trainee was in the truck with him when he got pulled over. Mark claims to have zero idea what the arrest could have been about, while the trainee in the truck threw out the idea that it could be in relation to Dylan. There's a passenger, there's a passenger. Just keep your hands up, buddy! Just keep your hands up! No, I won't. Watch the cab. I got the cab. Drop a cigarette. Can you explain to me what's going on? Yes, sir. Is your name Mark? Yes, it is. What had happened is they had got information that you were potentially up here, and they said that they had a uh, uh, a warrant for murder second for you. I'm sorry. I have no idea what that's about. No, he's a okay. good dude, you know. I know that there's something that something happened with his son, you know. So yeah, and I don't know the whole story. I you know I saw a little bit on Google or whatever, um, and it sounded like a kind of a long and involved thing, but. That kind of has come full circle, and, and Colorado saying, you know, we want to, we want to talk to this dude because we think we think he might have killed this kid. Mark was interviewed by an FBI agent, and this agent testified in court about the responses Mark gave since the interview was not recorded. The agent recalled oddities in Mark's story. When Mark was asked about items in the house that may have Dylan's scent on it, he states there were no items that belonged to Dylan. This is odd, considering Dylan was staying at the home. The officer inquires about the pillowcase that Mark was holding, and Mark said, oh yeah, this should work, since he supposedly slept on it. However, it is likely Dylan was killed the night he arrived to his father's house, and did not sleep there at all. A canine that inspected the house during the investigation also did not find any sense on it, or on any other objects in the house, since he removed evidence of his son ever being there. Mark had answers for everything, especially how traces of blood may be found in his house, stating Dylan's lip was bleeding. This would not explain how bloodstains were found on the coffee table and couch in a larger quantity than a lip would expel. We will hear the FBI agent recall obscure details that Mark told him during the interview. I said, we're going to be searching the place. We're looking for any sign of Dylan here. And I told him, you know, the, the, those items that I described before is what we would be looking for. What items? It's... Uh, Anything, it can be uh, hair, saliva, blood, especially, you know, signs that Dylan might have been injured in any way. Now, you've met with the defendant on November 26th and November 27th, and he had never mentioned any blood or injuries to you during those two conversations and three, including the written statement. That's correct. After I had mentioned the statement about finding blood and our response team is there, it's either as we're getting in the, the Suburban or we're, we're once in the Suburban, he said that Dylan had a cold sore or an ulcer on his lip that was oozing blood. So that was the first mention of any blood I had heard from him. First mention of any blood you'd heard from him in the three days you've been interacting with him? That's correct. What did he say Dylan did in this version after his mouth started to bleed from the football hitting him in the face? I don't believe we addressed it right then. I think I didn't want to question him. I'm in a suburban right now, backseat with other people, and we were going to talk at the office for quite a while. So it was, again, significant, I thought at the time, because he was admitting there was an injury to Dylan, and I decided we would just address it later. What was the significance of his story changing from no blood, cold sore, oozing blood, to football hitting Dylan in the face, causing him to bleed? you? Well, both stories, the defendant was changing uh, what had happened to Dylan to meet what he thought would be evidence. The, the truck represented evidence collected from the scene that would be collected. And then when he mentioned the cold sore, and I said, well, I could track that down pretty easily, he changed the story to the football. A court date was set for 2018 but had multiple delays due to Mark's attorney facing domestic violence charges of his own and 2020-related concerns. Finally, by July 2021, Mark Redwine was found guilty of second-degree murder and child abuse resulting in death. He was charged with 48 years in prison. Do you think there are other explanations for Dylan's death? Do you think this is a murder of rage? Or do you think Mark has fantasized about murder in the past? Thank you for watching and join me next time when we explore the psychological maze of some of the most wicked people.